Uh, welcome to this final Strad Sunday panel discussion. It's presented by the Strad magazine in celebration of its 125th anniversary and as a part of the London Symphony Orchestra's International Violin Festival. I'm Jane Cutler and I'm principal and co-founder of the De Capo Music Foundation and I'm now going to let the panel introduce themselves before we get uh, talking. Karen, would you like to start? I'm Karen Tweddle and I'm Havering's music manager. I'm William Bruce, I'm Head of Strings, next door at Junior Guildhall. I do a lot of work for Associated Board and my moonlighting job is with English National Opera in the evenings. <laughs> I'm Sarah Quinn and I'm a violinist in the LSO. Okay, so we've got three main areas that we're going to discuss. Um, and not much time. We've been discussing things beforehand and I think we could occupy ourselves till tomorrow. However, we'll endeavour to get through the, the things. So we're going to talk about introducing children to instruments. We're going to talk about starting pupils off on instruments and getting them playing. And we're going to talk about maintaining interest of pupils once they have an instrument in their hand. So uh, we all know how important it is to choose the right instrument. Uh, so I'm going to ask all the panellists to talk about this one and um, perhaps Karen would start with this one. So can you tell us how you introduce instruments to children? Um, okay, um, we start uh, at our infant level. Uh, we have, um, depending on if we've got a Saturday school or during the week, our children will get an opportunity to have a musical zoo where they come along and depending on which programme they've taken, if it's a string programme or a wind and brass programme, they will have an opportunity to try all those different instruments and experience those not only with, it, with the staff but with our senior students who do some demonstration and who help to actually uh, help them play, try the bow hold, all of those sort of things. Um, when we're out in schools, we do assemblies and we take instruments in and we get staff involved in the schools. We actually give some demonstration lessons to some of their teachers um, and the children love it and they have those instruments stay in school and our staff will help them to choose which ones they would actually like. So it's quite hands-on, really. Very hands -on. much so. Okay. William. Well, the Guildhall provision for beginners starts with two years of Dalcros and um, Kodai lessons. So they don't touch an instrument then, and that's aged from four till six. Then as, as they approach their, their sixth birthday, uh, we introduce them to instruments with peer concerts. So children a little bit older than them come and are already on the programme, come and play to them. And, and then we, have, we encourage them in our literature to go to all the LSO events for children, which as they're part of our creative alliance. Uh, and any of the, they can go and see any of the teachers at the start or the end of the day to physically have a go at the instrument, see if it suits nice, them. Nice. Sarah. Um, well, at the LSO, as part of our discovery programme, which, which is our education uh, work, we do a lot of work in schools. Um, one of the projects we do is called Sound Explorers, which is players going into primary schools and introducing the instruments to children of sort of four and five. Um, they don't actually get to try the instruments um, at that stage. It's just about the live experience, seeing the instrument, seeing somebody play it, listening to it. Um, we also run family mornings um, where children as young as two and three can come along. There's lots of instruments um, that are available for children to try. Um, and it's great because parents are there as well. So sometimes parents think, well, you might like the double bass, but we're not bringing one home. Um, and it's just, just a way to really explore an instrument um, and just to see how it, how it feels and, and how it fits. I chose the violin because my sister was having violin lessons and also my friend's mum played the violin and she came into my class at school and she played and I just thought, oh, wow, I think I'll have a go at that. And that was what got me started on the violin. So it was through that being introduced uh, at school. Can I just ask what diversity we have in the instruments? Uh, what instruments do you have on offer? Because that's quite interesting that you took up the violin because that was the one you were shown. <laughs> um, in Havering we have, um, I should say, all sizes in all colours really. We do um, double bass, we do down to the very smallest size and we start our double bass pupils usually in year three. Um, violin and cello are on offer in infant level, but they're done through a kindergarten programme, so they would start recorder if they wanted to learn a brass and wind instrument, and they would do violin or cello um, at infant level. But we've got a 30-second size, which is our smallest, 
up to, uh, well, full size, but obviously an infant wouldn't be on that. So, yeah, all sizes. The string training program, we're limited by how many people we can get in the building. Uh, people have their names down from birth to, to try and to get, get on. We turn around 80 a year away. So we focus on strings. So anything with strings on it, there's um, the, the violin, viola, cello, double bass, harp and guitar. And also as a piano has strings, we offer that as an additional study. On the music course from 11, it's all the instruments. Okay. With us, it's just any, anything you'd find in an orchestra. So not, not guitars um, and not saxophones, but you'll get everything else. <laughs> Lovely. Um, do any of you find you've got um, different responses from different groups of children? You might go into a, a, a school with a different profile or you might be in a different county. I, I, I don't know where you do uh, the LSO uh, concerts. You focus in London. Or, you know, are there different, different responses from different... I, um, I think um, it doesn't matter with children, it doesn't matter what sort of their ethnicity or their background, if they're poor or rich, every child loves music and they love to hear it and experience it. So I think it's a different type of issue that you have to deal with when it comes to educating. It's not just about the children, because children love it. They're always open to knowledge and finding things out, regardless of any of their backgrounds. It's about trying to involve the parents and trying to educate a, a holistic approach so that more and more people will come in and actually experience that music. We have open days at our Saturday school, and we encourage people to come in um, from any background, and, they, and it's a free event, and that's it also really important. It's to make sure that it's free access to music which doesn't always happen everywhere. So, mm. you know, it's mm. about giving access, really. Yeah. So? Well, I, mean, I would agree completely yeah. with what Karen says. I mean, our school's concerts that we do are here at the Barbican. So we will, this hall will be filled um, with children, and we do concerts for all the ages, um, all the key stages. And we go into schools in all parts of London. So knowing how diverse and different London is, um, we're reaching a huge number of children um, in schools, and as Karen says, all children everywhere love it, and they, they love to join in, they love to take part. I think it makes a huge difference um, at all ages. And does anyone have a sort of, vary of thing, variety of things that they use in these demonstrations? Do you, have, do you pull something out of the bag when you're in a particular place, or is it always the same thing we're, we're dealing with to introduce children? With assemblies... Um, I do a request spot, so children will often call something out. Um, so I, I have a bank of things. Um, I, I'm, I'm embarrassingly, I listen to all sorts of things on the television, um, so that if I can play something that, first of all, they can relate to, um, and they recognise it, but because they hear it on a violin, it changes the way the tune sounds. So it takes them longer to actually work out what it is sometimes. So you play it a few times and it, it's, it's about engaging with them and getting them interested and then you can play them other things which hopefully they then will be more inspired to actually get involved with and listen. Mm. So a nice bit of Brook Violin Concerto is, mm. is quite nice to just calm a very loud assembly. <laughs> Okay, so having introduced children to instruments, we move on to the important job of teaching, uh, teaching the instrument and the question of how to keep children engaged during instrumental lessons. So um, you can be as detailed as you like. Karen, can I ask you to describe activities you find work best in engaging children within an instrumental lesson? Um, I try to arrange, and I know other staff do as well, we try to arrange... Um, different pieces of repertoire so that all children can be engaged at all levels so they're not they're working at their own pace but music is continually happening so that you don't have a child standing there so if we were teaching in a group of three um, you might have one who's really able and one who's struggling some, somewhat so you have to try and make sure that the one who's really able can sort of be an assistant and they can come and help so it's keeping everybody engaged and at more senior levels I tend to use, they've, they've all got their phones with them um, and they break their rules in school because they get their phones out and record themselves performing and we have like a practice diary so they can take their performances away and then in four weeks time we re-perform and they listen again and they can do some real active compare and contrast as to what they've actually done. Mm -hmm. So it's all about, it's engaging with them at whatever level they're at really. It changes. 
Well, looking back to my school days, the lessons I was most engaged with were entirely dependent on the teacher. So I think a, a fertile, fun, imaginative lesson plan uh, led by the teacher here is, is key to it all. The package we offer is supported with the Kadai and the Rhythmics lessons, and it's very, very well structured, so it relates to the material they're working on. So they're constantly making links. Um, two approaches really, the, the step from the known to the unknown and the lesson of a thousand discoveries, but then the joyous bit and the thing we all in, like most about instrumental lessons is playing with other people. So we have an ensemble and we bring in the instrumental expertise as well as the class teachers so they can re relate the Kadai to the actual playing experience in, in a focused way. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think anything that makes the lesson fun. I think when you're seven, um, half an hour can seem like an eternity. Um, and I had two pupils at one point, who, both of whom were seven-year-old boys, and they were very, very different characters, and they, they were both fantastic, but they had a sort of, they went in 10-minute slots. Every 10 minutes you had to do something different, because it was just, you know, quite a lot for them to take in. And one of them just really loved it if you played with him. So that could be anything like, it, it would be lovely if we all had an, an accompanist we could bring with us to every violin lesson, that would be great, but we don't have that luxury. So I would sometimes play a bit of the piano part on the violin and we just play together and that whole experience of just hearing somebody else with you so just ch just changed it for him and he used to love that. And the, the other one, he, he was great. He just loved making things up. So we would sometimes just stop and he would just play something. He said, I'm just going to play something and you play something back. So we would just do quite a bit of call and response, making things up, you know, anything and everything, whatever he wanted to do. And we would do that for a little bit and then we would get back to whatever it was that we were doing. And it was just to break things up a bit um, because I think it's, it is a long time to concentrate. And I think with lots of things, and we'll come on to it in practice, is <laughs> concentrated, well-used time rather than 45 minutes of not really doing very much um, is preferable. So I think like Karen and William said, you know, making things interesting, keeping it fun. I'd, I'd just like to say that in, at De Capo and with my teaching, and as somebody who was not accepted in the school choir, I have to say, so it's come to me very late, I sing and we all sing in our lessons, perpetually singing. I have to say we do a lot of Kadai work, uh, but I think if you sing with children, they learn to play with song. So I don't know if that's been missed, missed out because it's often very easy to presume that singing is obviously going to happen. But in many instrumental lessons, singing doesn't happen. And so you get a very stilted kind of, you know, we just move the bow left to right. Breathing. Breathing. Yes. Because yes. yes. yeah. you're a string player. Yes. They tend to not think about yeah. the actual breathing yeah. in and out. Yeah. And, and it's amazing how much that makes a difference to the way children play. And, and that sounds stupid, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, it's, it breathe, does. It, it's so obvious. And I was never taught to sing, and as I say, thrown out of a choir. <laughs> but uh, I've learned to come to grips with that one. We should all be able to sing, however badly. OK, we've talked about uh, activities in the lesson, but I actually find one of the most useful things is very good repertoire. So I'm going to ask William to start us off on this one and tell us where you access your repertoire, maybe what you find the best repertoire is, and do you tailor it? Well, as head of a department, uh, we have a curriculum for, for the baby programme, but it's based on outcomes. So we don't restrict the teacher in the way they approach. They play to their strengths with their repertoire, with their teaching style, but as long as the outcomes match uh, our, our curriculum, everything works well. And it's, it's very difficult as a teacher. You walk along this very narrow line. You, you, you get very efficient teaching. Um, a small number of pieces, you can do them very quickly, but you bore yourself rigid with them. <laughs> and this is one of the advantages of using an uh, outside examining system with a constantly changing syllabus, that it forces you to explore other, other music, and it's an enriching experience. Unfortunately, the exam system can be misused when the syllabus is used as a curriculum and mm. it's not. The teachers need to teach in a much broader way. Um, I, should, should we be teaching the children what we think they should be enjoying at their age? Oh, well, this is, <laughs> I'm, perhaps I'm controversial on this, but I think there has to be a balance here. We, we have no need to apologize for a Mozart minuet ever. Uh, as a six-year-old will get enormous amounts of pleasure, and it's not up to us to say they, they shouldn't be. Um, that's where I stand on yes, that one. I think we can. I think we can be quite frightened, can't we, of, of uh, giving something that's old, and no Mozart's dead, but uh, we can still play his music, and actually they value that. Karen? Um, I totally agree, actually. Um, we, we recently did a, a performance of Zadok the Priest, and um, it was from ages 8 to 80, 
Um, so the, the, the little children there had all learnt to sing it and they were all involved and they'd learnt an open string part to it um, and you could see them in the corner bopping around to Zadok the Priest. So I think that it's about how we educate the children, it's about putting whatever they're learning in the context of where it was and what it meant at the time. So part of what we do as instrumentalists is to make sure when we're doing this music is that the children understand who they were and that, that, was, um, that was the Beatles of their time, or that was uh, uh, Slim Shady, or whoever it was in their world that used to be, it's, it's being relevant, it's making sure that they can understand where it is in that historical context. So all the repertoire they use is either through exam boards or um, we have teaching, we use Cathy College's methods, there's all very diverse, um, but the outcomes, as, as William said, we have a sort of a policy and we follow our, our sort of school curriculum as to what we expect them to actually achieve. Yeah. Sarah? I, I would agree with everything that um, Karen and William say. The only thing I would say, sort of more specifically about repertoire, um, I tend to teach the way that I was taught. Um, and when choosing repertoire, well, I hope, I hope it works, um, often depending if there's a, a particular... I won't say problem, but something that needs working on, technically, for example, I will always try and marry up repertoire to studies or whatever that we are doing so that if you're often um, a pupil is, is, you know, wading their way through some studies and let's face it, they are sometimes not very exciting and they are hard work, they're called studies for a reason, um, that the repertoire that sort of goes alongside that um, is is A, interesting, but B, will show them that that study is working, why they're doing it. Um, so I think Karen's point about context um, is very important, that what you're doing, if you're doing the boring scales and the studies, that they see where the scales and the studies will get them um, in terms of interesting pieces. And I have spent many, many hours trawling through um, music catalogues and shops and albums and books trying to find the right repertoire for the right pupil and so much of it is about where a particular student is at and what they need and that is a constantly changing thing and it takes such a huge amount of time actually choosing repertoire it's it's yeah it's very interesting but it, it can take a really long time to get it right um, so I think it's very important um, that we steer them in the right direction. Right direction. So it sounds to me like we have a curriculum-led repertoire rather mm. than repertoire-led curriculum, because I think that often happens, and I think what you were saying with the, the exam boards, they are used as a curriculum, but it's just repertoire, and so we need to look at very carefully at what we're trying to actually teach the children. OK, let's move away from our specifics and talk a little bit about our role as, as the teacher. So I'm going to ask the panel to talk about are we instrumentalists or are we uh, music teachers? Because obviously um, we have to be both, really. But I I'm going to ask Karen to start, I think. Um, so do you see your job primarily as an instrumental teacher or are you a music teacher? Um, I am probably both. Um, it's very hard to, for me uh, to actually separate the two because I see it as far more holistic in what we do as a service. So as a service, I am primarily, I'm a violin teacher, that's what I do. I also have um, cello and bass pupils and viola pupils as, as part of what I do. So I, I am an instrumental teacher, but equally I oversee a music curriculum for our service. So I'm trying to look at that and integrate that and make sure that all aspects of music are covered within the instrumental lesson, but equally the children have an ensemble that they can perform in at whatever level they're at. And also they have a, a, a musicianship curriculum that's based on Kodai, but it will broaden out so it will incorporate things like sight reading and oral and scales. So I have a bigger overview, if you like, in my role as in, in, in the service. And, and it's been very interesting. I'm actually quite immersed in that at the moment, which is why I feel I'm a little bit bipolar. Um, I was the, I've was i gone down a different path, and, and it's a very important one. And it's something, I think, that will hopefully... Um, broaden and, and engage our children far more, not only as, as string players, but as, you know, complete instrumentalists. So I think I'm a mix of the two. I, I'd agree. I, I probably am as well. Overseeing the <laughs> department, it offers a package uh, and of specialist activities, and they all come together 
in, with the child's journey. Uh, I don't want, we don't want the Kadai teacher to teach the rhythmics lessons or the, the ensemble teachers to start teaching position changes. We, we want each one separate <laughs> and that seems to offer, with my other hat on as a private teacher, which is, is my Sunday job, um, mm -hmm. it depends on the child's journey. Every child's on a different journey and if they're not getting any of that from anywhere else, I have to tap into their learning styles and, and, and tailor my teaching approach to their individual, to each individual. So, uh, no real answer for that. Hmm. Um, I would say probably a mix of the two, but I, I think primarily a music teacher. Um, just because my job here at the LSO is, is very busy, I've, um, I spend most of my time doing that. Um, so, I don't have many pupils who I teach one-to-one -one regularly. Um, so when I'm working with groups either in a classroom or, for example, if I go to Havering and I'm working with a, a, a group of children who I've never met before um, and I may only see them three times for, for a, a project like Take a Bow or, mm -hmm. or some of the things that we've done. So I may look at them and think, oh dear, that's, that sort of that bow arm's not working, but I can't be their violin teacher, they've got a violin teacher and what I want to do is to take what I've got um, and, and make it as good as I can. And I think in that way you have to be a music teacher and just take, take the whole picture, um, particularly with, with mixed ability ensembles because they can be absolutely brilliant, really, really amazing, um, but you've got to sort of know where to pitch it. Um, so I would say probably I'm more of a music teacher. This is nice. It's quite interesting that, of course, we're all in different settings, but we're trying to make sure that the children have every opportunity because we realise possibly that the one-to-one -one lesson on its own is now very out of date and we need so much more to enrich the child and enable them mm -hmm. to participate in a full musical life. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like every situation, even on the Sunday, when you're on your own, mm -hmm. you know that there's so much more than just playing the cello and so you have to mm -hmm. uh, give them as many different opportunities as possible. It's nice, I mean, at the Guildhall to have the opportunity that you've got the specialists to do the job so that everybody can get on and do it and not have to spin all the plates yourself. <laughs> I know that one. Um, I think we've answered that, really. If we're working with musicianship in our sessions, and maybe if we're a one-to-one -one teacher and we're not actually responsible for the musicianship part of their lesson, how are we drawing out children's ideas? What contribution are children having to these lessons? Um, how can we encourage creative thinking from our pupils? You'd like to start? <laughs> you go. Oh, yeah. oh William's going first. <laughs> okay. Creative thinking. Well, interesting. Um, my, my own view is that ch children don't need teaching music. If you walk past a playground of five-year-olds, can you hear the fizz in the air, the excitement, the energy? That's music. They're, they're, these are young poets. A six-year-old will do anything you, can, you ask of them. They're, by the time they reach 12, they've had so many instructions in life, <laughs> they get very restricted. So the, the most successful teaching I've been privileged to observe is where the teacher's role is to take out the technical blocks and allow that creativity to come forward. Now, it needs nurturing once it comes forward, and you can do that in, in, uh, at Guildhall. We have, we have jazz, we have improvisation classes, we have composers' classes, and the composers play, uh, perform, have their music performed by other students so they can hear what it's like. So there's a big fizz in the place. If anyone ever wants to look around, I'd be delighted to show you. Um, uh, so it, it's, I think it's people... It's, having the luxury of, of having specialist roles, going back mm, to the previous mm. question, that can enable all this to happen. If we've got instrumental teachers that, that are just involved in their small groups, um, one of the things that I think I've, I've observed in the past is, is that children often think that when they take something up, it's difficult. And I think a role of a good teacher is, is to take away those barriers so that nothing feels like it's beyond them. So if, if you want children to experience things, the last thing they need to feel is inhibited, especially if they're creating. So if you can get them to just be free and enjoy, and that we do lots of copying games, the children will sing, um, they can march around. I mean, one of the, the things I did in a primary school was I had a, a little group of infants, and we'd learnt a little piece, and they, were, they, they learnt to sing it, and then they played it. And then our little concert was to march 
all the way around past all the classrooms <laughs> and they had to play it quietly and they had tiptoes as they were playing it quietly and then they had to march it. And it's about engaging and, and getting their creativity and getting them to feel relaxed so that they went home and told their parents and the parents said, can we see it in a concert? So it's making it engaging and relaxing and enabling, really. You talked about uh, the people that used to play to start with and you had to do copy. Do you ever extend that kind of thing to like a full composition? Because actually, if any of you are having to work with the national curriculum, composing is still on this and it's a, it's a bit of a bugbear, I find. So do you ever extend that initial creativity of playing to you and you having to play back into something that's a little formalised and called a composition? Um. I haven't, I'm really terrible at improvising, I'll just say. Yes. Um, I, w I really <laughs> I wish I was better at it. I'm a, I'm, I've got a bit of a thing about it. But um, ch ch one thing I've I found working with young people um, uh, in schools, you know, everywhere, is that they um, never cease to surprise you. And often somebody will arrive in a lesson saying, I've written this, and you just think, well, I, what's that? And it will be something that they've just, for whatever reason, gone home and written. Or they've, I mean, it's great, in this digital age that we live in, they'll have recorded something or they'll have some computer program I don't understand or can't use and they'll have, and they'll play it to me. And, and I have to say, I just think, wow, that's amazing. So I, um, I think, like um, Karen and William were saying, all of these things that encourage um, getting out of your comfort zone, getting those barriers down, singing, ensemble playing, composing, improvising, all the things that often we just don't have time mm. to do. Um, I think it's really important to focus on those things. Um, yeah, be nice it's quite nice to do that at a, an early age because yeah. the older the children get, the more inhibited they yeah. become. So if it's just part of their everyday, a bit like a stable diet that they just have and they know it happens, um, you might get, as a teenager gets older, you might get the raised eyebrows <laughs> or the... Um, but, but within reason, it's something that's within their comfort zone, so they're more able to do it. Mm. It can be quite tricky to keep that kind of thing going when you know you've got this piece and this piece yeah. and mm, yeah. I need to do mm, some of yeah. these. And, yeah. It's finding time in, yeah. it's finding time in the lesson. Too. There is never time enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we all know that children have different levels of concentration, and, of course, concentration affects the progress of, of your pupils, so I'd like you to sort of talk to me about how you uh, deal with concentration levels and what you expect from pupils uh, and how you work with that sometimes loss of concentration or lack of concentration. Who'd like to go first? Karen, you go first. You just <laughs> finished talking, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, they'll um, get a go. I think um, speaking as, a, as a, somebody as a child who probably didn't concentrate as much as I should have done, I've, I've developed ways of working. I, I can always spot the child whose mind is on what the breakfast <laughs> is and, um, and what they, they, you know, I wonder what I'm going to do when I get back to class. Or, so it's, it's about knowing the pupil as much as it is about engaging with their concentration. So it could be that you, when they come into their lesson, if you know that they've got a concentration issue, you have to give them specifics so that they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing whilst they're there. So even if you know they're not concentrating, keeping them engaged and you get them in the palm of your hand and then you work with the other students and they, they keep them on task. So you say, he's had his three things that he's supposed to do or she's had what she's supposed to do. If you think they're not concentrating, will you let me know? And because they then, watch and they engage but it's not just about me it's about supporting my staff because my staff sometimes sometimes when we get new staff in and they're new to teaching it's very important to have a framework in place so that staff can have a forum they can come and speak to you and say what do you do about this child or even with children with learning difficulties um, very often you're going to a school and it won't be given to you as an instrumental teacher what their problems are. So you know they're there because you deal with children lots and you know they've got issues. Um, but it's about working at a level that's comfortable for that student. Um, and it is very difficult because of you know, confidentiality. As instrumental teachers, we're not treated sometimes in the same way as class teachers. So we are guests and we have to respect that. So we do tend to try and work and make sure that we know what the issues are surrounding some children with concentration. 
Sounds like you're advocating sort of structure for lessons, which sounds rather good to me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move on. Um, we've talked about uh, interesting pupils in instruments. We've talked about starting them off, but we know that learning an instrument takes years, and I think, I think Sarah has something quite interesting to say about her own experiences, about how she was as a child. I think this is a, a, a nice one. So, Sarah, can you talk to us about how important it is we don't give up on children and uh, we need to maintain an interest in the child as long uh, as well as the child maintaining an interest? Can you give us a little... Um, without wishing to talk too much about myself... Um, Please do. <laughs> I think... Um, Every child, I mean, every child is different. Um, they all work at, at their own pace. Um, and the relationship between teacher and pupil is, is, is really, really important. Um, and sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that because um, I'm a successful player, that I must have been a joy to teach. Um, and I was anything but. Um, and there is also the assumption that I must have had terribly musical parents and it, everything was, was really terrific. And my parents liked music and they wanted us to have lessons. Um, but I'm one of four and I'm, I'm the musician in the family. And I had three main teachers and I went in five-year slots. And I don't know why, but by the time five years was up, I had seemed to have reached the end of that relationship with a teacher. Um, I was... A lazy pupil, I think that's putting it mildly. And what I loved to do, and I think it happens a lot with children, is I loved to play. I think that's why I was always so fascinated about wanting to, to be in an orchestra. That's what I loved to do. So you couldn't get me to practice my uh, studies, but I would play the second violin part of the Mozart minuet that we were doing in the school orchestra, because that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to practice the difficult things. Um, and I think that was... Every teacher I had had that frustration with me. And there were endless phone calls to my parents who just assumed I was getting on with it. And I would come home and they would say, how was your lesson? I said, oh, it was fine. And so they thought, well, that's great. And then, of course, the phone would ring and sort of, and, you know, the teacher would say, you do know she's not doing any work at all, can't get through to her at all. And this was a huge shock to my parents. Um, so it, I think setting goals was important. But even still, I don't know, I think I'm just stubborn. I don't know where it was, but there was certain things that it didn't matter what it was. I mean, I don't know if, if any of you are teachers, but there's that wonderful piece, you know, Preludium and Allegro. Loved the Preludium, didn't want to play the Allegro. <laughs> That's a bit difficult. So I would practice that for hours and hours and hours. Did I want to play the Allegro? No. And it didn't matter how many times my teacher said, I don't want you to play the Preludium. Do not <laughs> practice. Please, I forbid you to practice this Preludium. I want you to practice the Allegro. I still wouldn't. I mean, it's, 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 it's very pig head it really when you think about it um, so I was really dragged along I feel by my teachers I was nagged by my parents please will you practice please 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 but I didn't have parents who had time to stand there in a room with me saying oh that wasn't in tune do it again they, they just our lives weren't like that um, so they were relying on me which is not a very good idea um, and my teachers to sort of you know somehow together we would make this happen. But what my teacher at the Royal College of Music taught me, which I think was the most important thing that I ever learned, was how to practice. I'd never learned that before. How to take something apart, how to figure it out, how to realise what was wrong, diagnose the problem and fix it. And I think I spent an awful lot of my time doing that still as a player, as an orchestral coach, working with young people, seeing the problem, figuring out what to do, doing it and hoping that it works and hopefully it's a bit fun along the way. But no, I was a, a dreadful pupil and I wanted to play, not practice. And if I could have practiced what I now preach, I mean, who knows, who knows where I could have gone. <laughs> but, um, but I didn't, I was stubborn. And I didn't do the quality practice that I demand of my students. I don't want you to spend an hour just messing around. I want you to do 20 minutes focused work. I didn't do that. So now I feel a little bit sort of poacher termed gamekeeper. Um, do you ever have sympathy for those pupils who don't do what you're asked and behave oh, like you? Yes, yeah, so I just think, oh, God, that is me. You're so like me. Um, but I, I, I know that it, it gets in the way. I mean, so I feel like saying, so you're being a bit like me. Don't be like me, because I know, I know what that but is. And I understand. I understand. <laughs> but really, you'll, you'll get a lot further if you, if you just 
you know, can get over this. And so um, I'm, I'm not really okay. a great example. <laughs> but, no, but um, it's interesting. I think it's representative of the fact that we ha all have very different pupils. And I think you say you were stubborn, but it shows character to me. And I like pupils who have character. Yeah, yeah. They're the interesting ones. Um, William, do you want to talk to us about how important it is to set goals and what they might be? Um, so, so can you repeat the question? <laughs> How important is it to set goals and what might those be? Oh, as a teacher, vital. Yes. Uh, because otherwise, um, I, I was just wondering how many people in the hall learnt a musical instrument as a child. So stick your hands up. How many of you were taught how to practice? <laughs> I think that's what it is. The most successful lessons I've seen are where the teacher uh, identifies the issue, comes up with a strategy, and if practice is to mean anything during the week, tells the student how to get there, how to practice that, that particular point. Uh, and uh, many teachers, one still sees, um, go through their holistic lesson plan and actually miss out on the fundamental thing. In this day and age, we're, they're all plugged in, aren't they, to... Uh, uh, iPhones mm. and, and this, this community of people. In the old days, a child would come home with, with the violin case and they'd be in the adult world. They'd be in, you know, with, but not now. They, they bring their own world with them on, on this device. And, and it's very hard to get into that. But what you can do is go the other way. And there's a wonderful app called um, Music Journal, which um, many of us use, and you put in you know, how much you spend on your exercises, your scales, your stretches, your piece, and at the end of the week, a lovely colourful graph comes up, and you show it to your teacher, and they're very happy, and I mentioned it to my students, and they all immediately did more practice and showed me this, uh, <laughs> and it's free. Ah, <laughs> so if you, still pr if you still pr play your instruments, do download it. <laughs> Well, I'm, I know we're pressed for time, and I want to give time to the, for the audience, uh, and I've left the two biggies to the end, so maybe we can be brief, which I know we don't like to be particularly, but um, really important to talk about the parents' role here uh, and how we involve parents in the children's learning. So maybe, Karen, if you want to talk about that. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I like and we like as a service for parents to, we have an open door policy, we have uh, certainly in the infant level, um, we don't mind parents coming in at all and observing lessons and being a part of what goes on. Um, we also teach some of the parents how to sing some of the songs that the children are learning. We've sent song banks home on uh, little discs for them to play and they can play them in the car. Um, so parental involvement, certainly at the very onset, the very start, is really quite important. It, but it's also how to educate them, the parents as they, the children progress, because there are sometimes parental goals that teachers have different goals to. So you have very ambitious parents who really want the very best for their children and think they know what that is. And it's, it's very hard to get that balance. Um, because they want their child to have taken grade one and then a term later to have taken grade two and then another term later. And, and they don't understand that that isn't the way. At times, it can work. And it's not about the grades. It's about the children making the progress. And the grades is, is just a means to an end. It's a, it's a piece of paper, but it doesn't mean that the child has really... What does grade two mean? Um, it's, just an, it's just a level. Uh, how it, they're engaging with their instrument and their music is the most important and a grade is just something that they can say they've achieved, but it doesn't, doesn't mean they're the best musician. Does that make sense? Yeah, no I was going to touch on grades, actually, because I think it also as part of the... the we're talking about setting goals um, just a moment ago, is that the grades thing can be such a double-edged sword. It can be great to, for something to work towards. I think it's really important. I only got to grade six. Um, I started when I, I started the violin when I was eight, and I was just, you know, I was a bit of a slow starter. Anyway, I only got to grade six, and that was, you know, I think I was 17 then, so there was no point. But, you know, you do hear of, of kids who've done their grade eight when they're 12, mm -hmm. and, th and that's fantastic, but not everybody can achieve that. And often you have a child who's playing grade two pieces, who's the most natural, most beautiful player in the world. They just haven't had the time to acquire all the technique yet. And somebody who's struggling through a grade eight piece, so they call themselves grade eight. But as Karen said, that doesn't mean anything, I'm sorry to say. Um, and I know it means a huge amount when you get your grade eight. And it can be very, very rewarding and a great goal to work towards. But at the end of the day, it, it, you know, it can mean two completely different things with two different pupils. So I think often um, with parents, they can be a, a little bit too focused on, 
on, on that being some sort of scale of, of ability, and it just isn't. It just isn't the case. A way to get no. UCAS points is what we're. Oh, well, yeah, that's another. Yes, that's, that's another, another one. one. <laughs> <laughs> We've got five minutes left. I'm going to ask you to go very, very quickly on the issue of practice. We have sort of touched on it. So, if anyone wants to just say one last thing about practice, and then I'll throw it open to the floor for a couple of questions. Anyone? Any? Anything to add about practice? I think I'm just going to shamelessly plug myself here uh, to say that I've written about practice. John Shaler has written about practice, a brilliant article that i uh, written probably 15 years ago now, which was published in the Strad magazine. And I thought, hurrah, somebody talking a lot of sense. Well, I can't, I can't uh, encapsulate it for you. Maybe you should go away and look at it. That's John Shaler uh, about practice. And then I, I wrote an article that was also um, published in the, the Strad about practice. And it's a very complicated subject, but I would would just say enforced practice is an absolutely bad idea. Leave the teacher to deal with the practice and do not bribe your children and do not force them to practice because you are building a big problem for when they can say no to you and you're building problems for the for the teachers. So uh, that's it in a nutshell, really. Yeah, Mine. I, I would just say that you know there is that saying no practice is wasted. I would disagree with yeah. that. I think an hour spent not concentrating and actually just practicing bad habits really is a waste of your time. If you're going on a family holiday, don't bring the violin. <laughs> just leave it at home. It's the best place for it. You don't want to hear it anyway when you're on holiday. Um, and just the other thing I would say about, about learning to practice is, I mean, mm. I remember when I think to my teachers, they just had the patience of a saint, but there were often weeks, and we all know what it's like for kids. There are certain times of year, it's very, very busy. There's huge amounts on, especially ends of term. I'm sure everyone's run ragged, running to plays, concerts, whatever, where, you know, a pupil will turn up and say, I've just had so much to do this week. I haven't had time. And that, I think, is the lesson where you practice together and you use that time instead of, oh, should we just go on to something new or should we just bemoan the fact that no work's been done? I think you turn it into a positive yes. thing yeah. and that practice is a positive thing. It's not a chore and something that you have to do. And practice makes perfect. That is true. But no practice mm. is wasted. Mm. Yeah. It's nonsense. We, we, Good practice. We've renamed practice at Guildhall quality time with our instruments. Our own <laughs> Lovely. Yes. I think we can scrap the word practice. It's too loaded. <laughs> okay, I'd like to open up to the floor is there anybody? Oh, I've got a very swift hand here. Could somebody get a mic over here? Are you directing it at one person? Because that would be very useful. Anyone oh, anyone will do. Okay. <laughs> First person to the, to the question. Maybe you'd like to introduce yourself and give you, uh, us a context of what you do. Yes. Um, my name's Peter, and uh, I'm involved with a couple of kids who play the violin, although I'm not teaching them because I can't play myself. Um, which leads on to, uh, in fact, it's two questions. Firstly, how important is it for the kids to give public performances? And secondly, what do you say when the performance goes badly? Oh, who'd like to talk about that? I think performing in public is great for kids, either by themselves or as part of an ensemble. I think ensemble playing is apart from giving performances, is so important in terms of listening, contributing, joining in, safety in numbers, all those things. Because some, some children just, they don't want to be them by themselves, or they think they'll be fine, and then they stand up there and think, oh, and it's a, it's a big <laughs> shock. And that can be quite difficult, and you don't want it to be a negative experience. Um, and if it is, what, what do you say about that? It, it depends. When you say something goes badly, how badly? I don't think anything's ever a complete disaster, and I think you focus on the positives, and there's got to be one there somewhere, I'm sure. I, I can't imagine a performance where absolutely everything goes wrong. Um, but I think to always try to, to be, and I think that goes with teaching as well, even if there are huge problems, or you think, oh, that's, that's, I feel like this is actually getting a bit worse. <laughs> I don't feel like it's really progressing. I think you just have to address it in a very honest way. I mean, per oh God, I can't imagine a scenario, but I think I would like to say to a pupil, you know, I mean, also children will know, they know they weren't yes, brilliant. Yes. They're the first people, and actually they're, yes. they're their own worst critics. Mm. They'll be the one who comes off and it's gone quite well saying, oh, well, that was a disaster. And it never is. And I think you have to just encourage them that maybe that didn't go as well as they'd like, but next time it will be better. And, or this is what we'll do for next time. So that didn't go quite well. So we'll work on that. 
And next time, I just think to try to take the positives, and I'm sure there always are. I okay, think. We, I'm sure we could all answer. That seems a good answer to me. Can, can we have another one more question? I think we lady in blue at the front here. Hi, uh, my name is Michiko. I'm a, a private violin teacher, and I teach from I teach this method. So I teach very from small young children from three years and up. And the problem sometimes I find is that um, nowadays children have so many opportunities. So they have drama, they have ballet, they have violin. Oh, now there's a recorder, all sorts of things. And once they start it, I think they should, that rather than trying everything out, maybe focus on one thing to see how far it, you, know, you can get there before diverging their interest or parents are a bit worried about all so the you, other ones. Uh, so your question is? Uh, how, is how to um, encourage m more, or, the, or how do you think about parents trying to try out everything too rather many, than... Too many focus. things spread, right, spread, spread to themselves too, th too thinly. Uh, William, do you want to... Oh, what, was it Robin Louis Stevenson said that the seeds of art lie in, lie in childhood boredom? Do, do you remember making that oh, daisy chain or, or yes. opening that book on a rainy day in the library and seeing a wonderful masterpiece? And children these days don't get bored. They, they, they get everything coming at them from all directions. And, and I think that's why they get distracted. They, they, then we give them mm. Ritalin to help them concentrate yes. after yes. distracting them with, with, with the help. internet and everything else. So so it's a, I mean, it's, it depends where they want to take their journey. Um, I don't think it's up to us to say if they take up an instrument, it should be the only thing in their lives. Because mm -hmm. if music has any place in a child's life, it's wonderful. Yes. And you don't have to take right. it to LSO level to, to, to get a wonderful journey. Yeah. But I do appreciate the... Uh, I think if, if as teachers we could spell out the commitment involved to say get to a grade eight at the start, that might give them a, a, an inkling of what lies ahead. And remember, why should the parent know? They, they, they sh they, many of them aren't musical. They, they don't know what they don't know. And it's up to us to, to help in their education as well as their children. Uh, my, my timer went off. I think we've oh. run out of time. I'm really sorry. But we did get through every single question. So um, I want to thank my fellow panellists for a great conversation. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.